Namaste. <laughs> so I'm sitting here. It's just sunset. Full moon is rising in the east. People are celebrating. <laughs> I don't know what, some festival. <laughs> and I am high as a freaking kite. <laughs> I don't know what this is. Well, of course I know what it is. Duh. This is <laughs> the, that, the result of me immersing myself in the service of the goddess for the last, I don't know, since this Lakshmi Tantra series started, I've been basically doing nothing but working on the series, editing the text so it's, you know, easier to comprehend for English speakers and uh, putting it in format for the videos and then, you know, actually shooting the videos, making the recordings of the readings and so on. And just basically between that and my ordinary seva of puja and japa and so forth, I've been completely immersed for the last, I don't know, month or so. And the only people I see are like the gardener who comes every other day. And really, I only talk with him maybe once a week just exchange a few words, but we have a good relationship. And when I go into town shopping, uh, I have a favorite shopkeeper and a, a favorite vegetable seller that I patronize. Boom. And uh, <laughs> she's a great devotee of the goddess. Maybe that's why we got the, the boom there. She's a great devotee. She smears her face with the uh, kumkum and the, uh, what's that called? That yellow spice? Huh? I forget. Anyway, <laughs> that she goes to the temple and, and takes this prashad, which has been offered to the goddess, and she smears it all over her face. She's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful lady, always has a smile and you know, she respects me as a Swami, so it's very nice. I respect her as a devotee. And um, let's see, who else do I see on a regular basis? That's about it. You know, and there are some people who, who want to come and visit me. And I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, I, it, I like very much hesitate to interrupt the flow of this wonderful state of devotion and you know I had made a couple of uh, videos about my days back in California in the, in the hippie movement and uh, just before I uh, became a devotee my neighbor is shooting rockets <laughs> and uh, how my guru actually saved me. He saved me from getting caught up in this meaningless drug scene, you know. And I had had spiritual experiences at the time of uh, taking some LSD and stuff. But I didn't know what they meant. And my guess is that there are thousands of people, maybe tens or even hundreds of thousands, who have had similar experiences, but didn't know what they meant, didn't recognize them, didn't value them, and so they didn't inquire into the actual nature and meaning of these experiences. So they missed the benefit. You know, if, what do you do when you get high? You just party? No. See, the, the human mind, and especially the Western mind, tends to go to extremes, you know? Well, if, if you're not just a, a drugged out hippie and high all the time and partying and whatever, then you become a religious fanatic and you're, you know, uh, super straight and high, highly disciplined and, you know, you never have any fun and all this. This is nonsense, you know, this is stupid actually. And the reason it's stupid 
is that the real sweet spot is somewhere right in the middle. You know, I actually went through that. I was a hippie and I was like constantly high and I was in different bands and whatever, you know, it was the 60s, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, there's whole years of my life that are just kind of a blur, you know. And um, then I went from that into the Hare Krishna movement, which is, you know, super, super straight and austere and regulated and disciplined and like that. And they're both wrong. What, where the sweet spot is, is right in the middle, where you can go to either side, but your home is where you don't exclude any possibilities. That I can get high as a kite and have fun like anything, and have a blast, and have spiritual experiences and everything that goes along with being high. But then, I can go to the other side and I can do regular sadhana, I can study the scriptures, I can understand the philosophy, I can develop devotion, I can meditate, I can do all the things that are advised in the scriptures for my spiritual advancement. And then the tools, the, the medicines, huh, the helpers, become aids in that process instead of being ends in themselves. And also, instead of the spiritual discipline being an end in itself, really our interest is in the result that we get. And we want to get that result. The problem with spiritual organizations is that they discourage getting the result of the sadhana because they want to keep you as a member and exploit you. You see, just like when my spiritual master, Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, passed away, the whole mood of ISKCON changed. And these bureaucrats came into power. And of course, they called themselves gurus and all of this. But really, they were just manager types, you know? They were like upper management mentality. But they weren't very spiritual. They didn't do strict sadhana. They certainly didn't do any spontaneous sadhana beyond the rules and regulations. They didn't go deeply into any of the uh, processes like japa or bhajan or kirtan or studying shastra or anything like that. That was lower level people in the organization. So instead of waiting and creating a safe space so that the next guru, the next acharya in the lineage could arise and come out and develop. They created this incredibly locked down, harsh, hyper-political uh, mood where they declared themselves gurus even though everybody knew they weren't qualified. And then they proceeded with this farce of guru theater, which really didn't benefit anybody. So, and then of course, slowly, slowly using legal strategies, they took temples into their personal property and sold them and stuff like this. And this is what's been going on since then. It sucks. So this happens in every spiritual organization I've ever seen. And it happens for the same reasons. Everybody loves the founder, the guru, the acharya. Huh? And so a bunch of really ambitious people want to get that kind of love and attention. So they pretend. And unfortunately, because they're high-functioning sociopaths, they can convince enough people that they are actually advanced that they get positions of power and influence. But then, as soon as their position is secure, then the real colors come out. They become tyrants, dictators, huh? and they simply exploit, exploit to the max. 
So this goes on in every spiritual organization that I've seen. So this is what's wrong with the right side. Huh? And what's wrong with the left side, we already discussed, that people will take drugs and just party instead of using them for sacred purposes. And the thing is, the people on both sides don't even talk to each other. Huh? The party freaks reject the discipline freaks, and the discipline freaks reject the party freaks. They don't realize that the sweet spot is right in the middle, where you don't deny yourself either. Huh? I like what Terence McKenna said one time. You know, Terence McKenna was the big mushroom guru back in the, well, actually 70s, 80s, 90s. And he said, we, we used to correspond because I had a research project about Soma, Vedic Soma, which was a, a psychedelic that was offered and distributed at Vedic sacrifices. So <laughs> one time he said in a talk, he said, stupid people take drugs like as often as they can. Intelligent people take drugs and then think about it for six months. Very smart man. He, <laughs> it's just so funny because we were just talking about that in the uh, Lakshmi Tantra where she says, People experience me all the time, but they don't recognize me because they're covered by my maya. See, so Terence had a real dislike of yogis and gurus and spiritual teachers like that. He thought we ought to be able to get all the knowledge we need just from the drugs. No, it doesn't work that way. The drugs are enhancers, they're tools. Uh, they're not, if you were repairing a car, of course you need tools. But you also need the shop manual that tells you how to repair the car. See? So in the same way, drugs and theogens can be tools to help us in our sadhana, but the knowledge of sadhana and the discipline that makes the sadhana work come from the study and discipline, the spiritual uh, doctrines and stuff like that. Scriptures, gurus, teachers. So anyway, he had a real dislike of anybody disciplined or following a scripture or anything like that. He didn't like that at all. But he had many experiences where he took, you know, a, a heroic dose of something or other and saw the goddess face to face and didn't recognize her. He couldn't see that this is the same Shakti described in the scriptures because he had a pathological dislike of scriptures. See? This is like the party animals who reject discipline. And then on the other side, you have you have the, the ISKCON gurus and people like that who would never touch any kind of drug or anything, right? Well, most of them anyway. <laughs> and, or at least they would never admit it publicly, right? But they're missing out on the enhanced energy and cognition that comes from using the helpers, the medicine, the entheogens, see? So they're both missing out. They're both missing out, and the reason why is that they deny the other possibilities. So what I'm saying is, the really intelligent person doesn't close off any possibilities, but discovers the appropriate use of each and all to attain the ultimate goal of complete self-realization. Om Tatsa, Om Shakti, Om.